Hello, everyone. As you join us this evening, we would love to hear where you are joining from and also maybe throw in your favorite North Carolina musician, band, or song. We're looking forward to having a great evening with you all. Um, so again, we'll give everyone just a minute or two to join, uh, let all our friends come on into the room. And as you join, tell us where you're joining from, uh, as well as your favorite North Carolina musician, band, or song. So uh, come on in, everybody, and uh, we'll get started in just a second. All right, and I'm seeing Raleigh and the Avid Brothers. All right, thank all right. you, Wendy, for sharing that. <laughs> So again, as you come on in, tell us where you're from, favorite musician, band, or song uh, that is North Carolina related. All right. Um, so as director of North Carolina Center for the Book here at North Carolina Humanities, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening's virtual book event. I'm Melissa Giblin, and I am so excited to begin our conversation on North Carolina popular music. With many other choices to spend your time, I thank you for choosing this event and for joining us at the fifth and final book event for this year's North Carolina Reads. North Carolina Reads features five books that explore issues of racial, social, and gender equality in the history and culture of North Carolina. As a nonpartisan statewide nonprofit and as North Carolina's affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, our mission is to connect North Carolinians with cultural experiences that spur dialogue, deepen human connections, and inspire community. This evening features a moderated panel discussion on Step It Up and Go, the story of popular music in North Carolina, the fifth and final book in our 2023 North Carolina Read series. Please note any views, findings, conclusions, opinions, or recommendations expressed by our partners and participants do not necessarily represent those of NC Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is my pleasure to welcome David Menconi and Dolphus Ramsur as our panelists this evening. I also want to wish Dolph, and I hope you will too, a happy birthday this evening. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> we hope that you stay with us through the end of the conversation as we have an exciting announcement at the conclusion of our program. Before we begin, we will briefly discuss a few housekeeping points for this evening's event and practice how to engage with us. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available after the live session on our YouTube channel. All five of the 2023 North Carolina Reads book events are available on our YouTube channel. We encourage you to subscribe to that channel at NC Humanities and give those videos a like. We'd love to hear from you during today's event. If you have a question, please send it through the Q&A tab or in the chat. Closed caption is available by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to share your experience on social media by tagging at NC Humanities on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Step It Up and Go shows how working class roots and rebellion tie North Carolina's Piedmont blues, jazz, and bluegrass to beach music, rock, hip hop, and more. North Carolina's music developed everywhere across the state from mill towns and mountain coves to college town clubs and the stage of American Idol. Step It Up and Go shows how homegrown music is essential to the state and its cultural identity. It is my pleasure to formally introduce our panelists this evening. David Menconi is the 2019 Piedmont Laureate. He is a critic and journalist who has been writing about music in North Carolina for more than three decades. His 2020 book, Step It Up and Go, the story of North Carolina popular music from Blind Boy Fuller and Doc Watson to Nina Simone and Superchunk, won the 2021 North Carolina Society Book Award. His next book, Oh Didn't They Ramble, Rounder Records and the Transformation of American Roots Music, will be published in the fall of 2023 by the University of North Carolina Press. Dolphus Ramsur was born and raised in North Carolina and is a music manager and record label owner. Through his long career, he has fostered the creative visions of musicians, including the Avett Brothers, Carolina Chocolate Drops, Sierra Farrell, Rhiannon Giddens, Amethyst Kia, Langhorn Slim, and Steep Canyon Rangers. His artists have sold out such prestigious venues as Madison Square Garden, Radio City Music Hall, Barclays Center, and Red Rocks Amphitheater. Ramsur was inducted into the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame in 2018 and currently acts as the organization's chairman of the board of directors. Welcome this evening, gentlemen, for our conversation. Thanks for having us. 
Great to be here. Um, so David, we're going to uh, jump right in and kind of alternate uh, with you and Dolph. Um, so I'm going to direct this first part of the question to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book? Well, I came to North Carolina in the early 1990s knowing very little about the state's music. Um, I'd been hired to be the music critic at the News and Observer in Raleigh. And, um, you know, the job was somewhat amorphous when I came here. As far as I knew, I'd be just reviewing concerts and things like that. But uh, pretty early on, I wound up doing a lot of stories about North Carolina artists. One of the very first was um, Etta Baker, the Piedmont blues woman, and driving out to her house in the summer of 1991 to uh, interview her was really amazing. And in fact, that's uh, some of that is in the book, as well as uh, an interview I did with Alice Gerard from Hazel and Alice, the folk group, and she's uh, over in Durham and has been for, for many years. And uh, at a certain point, it just became obvious that there was a book here. Uh, the first decade I was in, in Raleigh at the paper, it was just this learning process where there was this person after person where I was shocked to discover they were from here. Uh, Nina Simone, Link Ray, people like that. I'd heard about Doc and Earl and the college radio stuff before I got here, but there was just so much more to this state than I was aware of. So yeah, after 10 or 15 years, I started thinking about how would I do a book about this? And I didn't want to do it as just kind of disconnected, separate um, encyclopedia type entries. I wanted to turn it into a narrative uh, where it was all kind of linked together and kind of part of the same story. And what I hit on was uh, the populist working class traditions as embodied in North Carolina music. Now that's not, um, you know, it's, it's not that that doesn't go on elsewhere, but there it's, it's more of a thing here than most places. There's, there's more of a direct link from um, the old time musicians who were working in textile mills 100 and 150 years ago, uh, and the modern day punk rock band that uh, is working the day job grind, playing when they can and putting out their own records. And uh, it, the more I looked into it, the more that was a thing you could really link so many different kinds of music to going way back. The book covers about 100 years. So I started talking with University of North Carolina Press in 2004. That was our first conversation. It took a long time. There were fits and starts and I got diverted by another book or two that I was working on, but really finally started bearing down on this. Uh, 2017 is when I signed the deal. So, and then it came out in the fall of 2020. So it took either three years or 28 years, depending on how you reckon it, because I feel like a lot of the uh, work I did for the paper really laid the groundwork for this. Um, you know, the Doc Watson chapter was largely based on a big profile I did on him the year he turned 80 years old, you know, with some new reporting too, obviously. But uh, just the work I'd done for the paper was a, provided a pretty good skeleton to work on. And among those acts that sort of got to where the, you know to the to the top by grit and determination was the Avid brothers, and uh, Dolph, I'd like you to tell that story about the first time you got them on Merle Fest. Yes, so um, we had started to make the Avids had started to make some some inroads, uh, but at the same time, Scott Avid, if if your viewers are not aware, Scott is a world class. Um, oil painter, painter, uh, artist. Um, and he had, um, an opportunity to further his education in the state of Florida with, with art. And he let me know if we could get into Merle Fest, he would forego that art education and give music a try. And of course I did not tell him that you know, my first thing was I called the the festival the talent buyer and said we'll do it for free. Uh, so, uh, but they ended up paying us just a small stipend kind of thing, and we got they got into the festival and it really spread. Um, as David will tell you, like um, 
you know, if, if you're, um, if you're an up and coming band and you take the opportunity to play as many times as you can at Merle Fest, you can, you can catch fire and you'll be the talk of the festival. And that's, that's what really happened with Merle Fest. And then from that um, festival opportunity, uh, Merle Fest, and again, your viewers might know this, might not know this, but it's such a tastemaker festival around the roots music, acoustic music, Americana music around America, the world really. And so that really got a, our foot in the door in other places. So, and didn't y'all yeah. play like seven times that first Merle Fest? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a very busy uh, schedule and it just was, you know, you just kind of, uh, the Avits early on, you just, they were a, they had this special thing that I remember seeing them the first time ever. And I went home and I just, I couldn't tell my family, like I couldn't describe it. They had this it factor that you really, yeah, you can't describe. Well, thank you for sharing that um, story and those kind of behind the scenes. Um, I think that really goes to illustrate uh, David's point about, you know, this kind of comes from a, a lot of the music that we know and love here is uh, is grinded out at humble roots, right? You go to the festivals and you go and you put your time in and and if it catches fire and so much has, and there are so many, you know, well-known artists, as, as you said, David, um, that's just really just becomes part of the, the fabric and kind of leads me into my next question. Um, so I'll, I'll have, throw this one to you, Dolph. Um, in the prologue of the book on page seven, uh, it, it's noted that music is North Carolina's tuning fork. Um, it's not tobacco, it's not basketball, it's not NASCAR or even barbecue uh, because it's just, it's not just in the air here, but also the soul. So why do you think music is in the soul of North Carolina? Yeah, you know, sadly, North Carolina, it's a very poor state. So a lot of people uh, look inward to entertain themselves. Um, second, it's a very Bible Belt religious state. So people start to um, perform, sing in church as kids. Um, and uh, you mix those together with sort of that blue collar approach. And, um, you know, then when you really dig into it, the, the Scottish and Irish and African Americans that settled here, um, African Americans, I guess, through slavery, but it, there's a melting pot that's um, maybe unlike anywhere in America when it comes to music. You know, certain states like Louisiana and Mississippi, Mississippi's got the blues, Louisiana's got the blues and jazz, and but North Carolina's just so well diverse in all aspects. And, you know, I, I was married to a Lumbee, and I remember uh, going to my uh, mother-in-law's um, mother's funeral, and it was one of the most special things because in the funeral, they would allow the church, uh, someone in the uh, congregation to start a song. And it was the most beautiful kind of singing I had seen. It just, it was the whole church would join in. Well, then I would see like the Abbots do some of those same songs. And Jim Avett, Scott and Seth's father, you know, his, his father was a Methodist preacher. Uh, my mother-in-law, she, she grew up in a Methodist church in Lumbee and in, in uh, Pembroke, North Carolina. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just in the water, so to speak. It's hard to, hard to put your finger on really what connects us all. But uh, I think religion, poor state, entertaining yourselves, you don't have enough money to go uh, be entertained. So I guess we're lucky in, uh, in those aspects. Thank you. Um, David, I also want you to uh, elaborate on that as well, um, since you put that line in the book. Uh, <laughs> why do you think music is in the soul of North Carolina? It's, it's hard to say why. I mean, we're a crossroads. People are always on, coming through here on the way to somewhere else, and they often stick around. 
Um, and and uh, the, the role of colleges here cannot be discounted. I mean, especially towns like Chapel Hill and Durham, just how much of the music scene, particularly in the area of alternative rock, cropped up around college campuses. So you've got a lot of people coming and going for very, you know, from various ways. The the northern diaspora, people came through here on their way to New York City from, from Mississippi, and some wound up sticking around. So I, I think that contributes to this melting pot Dolph was talking about. And, uh, you know, when, when people were traveling, they took their instruments with them and yeah, music happened as it does. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I've, I've noticed that growing up in the Piedmont section of North Carolina, almost all families had a piano in the living room. And um, that was just sort of a way of life that just, it was there. Whether anybody could play it or not, that's a different story, but but everybody had one. So yeah, I remember one of the Kruger brothers telling me music is not a spectator sport here. Yeah. Um, and it's really true. Uh, you're kind of expected to join in. And it's funny, I never did just because I'm terrible and have no ability. It's better for everybody if I'm just out in the crowd with my notebook. But yeah. <laughs> well, I tell people that I'm I'm one of the world's greatest musicians. I just haven't found the instrument yet to get it out of me. So, <laughs> but yeah, I know the feeling. Very good. Well, thank you for sharing uh, that. And uh, we'll kind of segue to our next question. Um, and I'll, I'll start with you, David. Um, when you were researching, and I know you had mentioned this book was a long uh, process to kind of pull together. Uh, was there anything surprising or was there something that you maybe didn't previously know that you learned throughout the research process? The biggest thing would probably be beach music. Um, I am chastened to admit that when I first got here, I did not take it seriously because it just seemed like a lot of lame cover bands playing in parking lots. And um, I just kind of didn't get it. Um, and I would occasionally write about beach music, you know, when something happened like with the Embers. Um, I remember when they had kind of a, it came to a parting of the ways with their original front man and had to do a little story in the paper about that. But when I began researching it and the historical origins of it was really fascinating. And it wound up being almost my favorite chapter of the book, I think. Um, the way it came about during the Jim Crow era with uh, white kids being on vacation at the beach and slipping across the tracks to the other side of town and and uh, to go hear jukebox music in the nightclubs over there. And this whole subculture of and style of dance, shagging grew up around that. And then a few years go by and those kids are leaving home and going to college and take it with them. And then you have scenes on all the university campuses across the South, like in Animal House, when uh, Otis Day and the, and the Knights are playing. That was basically beach music. And uh, then a few years, and, and all the big R&B bands, like the Five Royales, who there's a chapter about from Winston-Salem, they got another round of popularity out of beach music, kind of after their tickets had been punched. And uh, as those bands were dying out, that's when bands like the Embers started up. And uh, the Embers continue to this day. There are no original members left. Bobby Thompson, the drummer, was the last original member and he had to bow out a few years ago. I think he's eight in his eighties now when he had to have a knee replacement, wow. but he's still managing their affairs. And, you know, they're, they're still playing. I love beach music all these years later. And, um, you know, they got members that have been in the group 40 years too. So it's not like it's just a bunch of imposters. So yeah, beach music wound up having a far richer history than dumb old me was uh, aware of. I, I've got this, a little story I have in the book. Um, I witnessed a couple of people in the newsroom not long after I got into the News and Observer uh, having a conversation and I heard the phrase beach music and I asked what is that like the Beach Boys and they looked at me and said oh bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's the same question clueless newcomers have been asking for many many years. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Um, Dolph, same question to you. Uh, as you kind of read through this, was there anything surprising or something that you maybe didn't yeah. previously know uh, about North Carolina music? Well, 
one couple things nantucket which uh david does a chapter and there were there were two things about that one that they started out as um a beach band um and in 78 79 as a kid they we had a local station wroq that was the rock station in the southern piedmont section here in north carolina and they had a song called heartbreaker uh, and they did an acdc cover called long way to the top and th those songs were played constantly on wroq and as an 11 year old kid i thought nantucket was like equal to acdc or van halen or it's you know it, it just was shocking to know that that was such a regional hit uh, and it did not really cross over into other states other than the Carolinas. Uh, but I was shocked that they were, they started out as a beach band. Um, and then that they were not, you know, successful um, all around America. So. They yeah. sure did try though, man. They worked it. <laughs> yeah. Toured and toured and toured. Yeah, that was, I, I love that chapter. That I, I always was sort of fascinated because as a kid, they were just such a big deal to me. Yeah, for sure. Um, especially if you're, you know, listening to that and you think like, I mean, if that's what, what's available and you're not, and you're like, yeah, that's, of course I want that. Like that's well, they're, you, they're the thing, they're the ticket. <laughs> when you grow up on a dirt road and you have four TV, five TV stations, there's no cable. Radio was such a big thing. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, David, I'll uh, kind of swing back to you as we move to this next question. Uh, we talked about the fact that the book covers so many uh, distinct styles and genres of music, and we maybe touched on this a little bit, um, but why do you think so many distinct styles and genres of music developed in North Carolina, and maybe why, as we kind of have mentioned, is it, did it sort of stay in North Carolina and maybe not get that national recognition? Well, part, part of it is what I mentioned before about being a crossroads, you know, people coming through here on their way to other places, and you had solid regional scenes across the state for, for various things. Interesting, weird detail about radio here. Um, the, all the towns in North Carolina are a certain amount of distance apart, and each has their radio stations. And that distance is basically how far a train could go on one tank of water. Hmm. So you have these towns all along in here and, and here in Raleigh, it's the strangest thing. We've got all these little towns not too far away and each has their own radio stations and they all bleed over into Raleigh. It's the most peculiar radio market because of that. All right, that's a little rabbit hole I just got down. But um, <laughs> you know why there's so many distinct styles, It's it's a, you know, diverse place. I mean, we, we have a large uh, indigenous Indian population. Uh, we got more people coming in from all over the world now. Um, Rhiannon Giddens, Greensboro native, uh, you know, her main collaborator nowadays is from Italy. Uh, you know, so you've got that and the, the universities and RTP are a draw and again, people bring their instruments. And then you've got institutions like universities and uh, those drawing pe people and you know they're they're forming bands but also there's just that that populist mindset we were talking about where people just rubbing uh, Dolph once had explained the Avett brothers earlier early years as uh, rubbing two sticks together trying to make fire and I saw this again and again with so many artists like uh, Ninth Wonder the hip-hop DJ from Little Brother started out making hip-hop records in his dorm room and, uh, you know, these were records that were like big deal national releases and got reviewed in all the big hip hop magazines. Uh, ben Folds Five, they came up with this really weird uh, formula where they were playing piano pop at the height of grunge, and there were only three of them. Uh, they could not have been more out of step, and yet somehow they had a, a platinum record. And just instance after instance of artists being really determined to get out there and do their thing on their own terms. And that just seems like a mindset that's very common here. 
That's, I feel like I just heard, since I've picked up this book, I have just heard Ben Folds 5 and um, the Squirrel Nut Zippers on, on the radio in the car and gone, oh, th there they are. Oh, no. <laughs> um, you know, just listening, uh, listening uh, kind of passively in the car and, and being like, oh, that's now I recognize that as North Carolina music. <laughs> um, Dolph, anything to add to that about uh, just the distinct styles and genres? Um, of North Carolina music. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you can look at all of the, uh, really the formats that you have from bluegrass to old time music, Piedmont blues. I mean, we have a whole form of blues that's really rooted in this state. Uh, and I think it's rooted in this state because of the, you know, when you get, when you think about Delta blues, it's very repetitive. And, uh, you know, Piedmont blues is more of a, um, uh, it's a mixture of all kind of songs from ragtime to reels to, to fiddle tunes that came over from Scotland and Ireland. And, um, but yeah, it, it's, um, you know, as a little kid, I remember Donna, Donna Fargo and Roberta Flack, and this is in the seventies and Ronnie Millsap and Charlie Daniels all having these kind of big moments in music. Uh, both country charts and in the pop R and B charts, but you know Charlie and Ronnie Millsap and Roberta Flack, if you put them all in a room, they could find common ground for sure. Um, you know, I'm, and it just maybe it just speaks to um, there's just this thread, this bloodline that goes through all of us here in this state. Um, you know, I. I, I try not to like with the Avits, I've just always sort of felt like they're a rock and roll band when it comes down to it. They play some acoustic music. Um, so I just try not to get so heavy on the labels. It's like David was talking a little bit ago about beach music and beach music's kind of hijacked like Benny King and Clyde Mc, th though, like Benny King was stand by me and save the last dance and, this magic moment, those really weren't kind of beach music songs. Those were real pop R and B hits. Um, and it's sort of now looked at as beach music in a way, which is kind of odd to me, but, um, so yeah, there's a lot of blurred lines with, with, uh, with that. David, anything else to add for that? <laughs> I think that about covers it. <laughs> well, um, the book does capture a variety of musicians and genres, but is there a musical genre or a musician that did not make it into the book that you would add? So David, I'll ask you that first. Oh, tons. I mean, I'm going to show you a piece of paper here. <laughs> this is, you know, the, the list. <laughs> I see Eric Church on there. Yep. You know, a lot of names. Yeah. So that's the great thing about North Carolina music. You could do another version of this book with a completely different cast of characters and it'd be just as good. Yeah. You know, um, North Carolina music is the resource that kind of keeps on giving and it's renewable. So, uh, yeah, there, there was lots and lots. And believe you me, I heard from plenty of people upset that their favorites <laughs> either we're not in there at all or we're not in there enough and you know just at a certain point you gotta you gotta stop um I, it could have been twice as long but uh i only had so many words to to go around for it that's fair um Dolph, what do you think is there a musical genre or musician that you you would add no, I mean, I, I so wish I would have had this book as a kid. Uh, I was just fascinated by music from this region. And I would go to libraries and search this stuff out as much as I could. And um, no, I mean, uh, I know there's a little, um, there's a little um, sidebar on the Mainers. I'm from Concord, North Carolina. And there's a little sidebar on the Mainers, uh, J.E. Mainer and Wade Mainer. And uh, my best friend growing up was J.E. Mainer's great-grandson. 
And um, I'll tell you a quick little story. So I met J.E. Maynard died in, in 1971, but him and his brother Wade, they, they recorded on the RCA Bluebird uh, label. And th they were pretty big, not as big as Charlie Poole, but in their own right, they were pretty big um, uh, musicians and influenced Doc Watson and the Stanley Brothers and, and uh, were great friends with the Carter family. Toured, J.E. toured down to Mexico to play on these big Mexican stations with the Carter family. Um, but, um, Jay died in the early seventies. I got to meet Jay's wife and she was in her early nineties when I met her and Jay had a radio station uh, and a radio show in Columbia, South Carolina in the forties. And he, um, he received to show you how big radio was. He received 14,000 letters from that station they they took she showed me this photo of jay with all these letters and she could tune in from concord to his noontime show and if he played a fiddle tune a certain fiddle tune that meant get in the kitchen and start cooking because me and the boys are coming home from columbia <laughs> south carolina for dinner and I always thought that was, she told me that story. I always thought that was fascinating. But yeah, you could go on and on. And I, I remember I, I reached out to the state of North Carolina. You know, you see the silver historical signs about getting one for J.E. And, and Wade Manor. And they let me know that they'd already recognized Charlie Poole as the old time musician from this state. And they probably wouldn't recognize another one, which I thought was sort of backwards in a way. Yeah. So anyway. But my, my favorite Wade Maynor story is one from David Holt, uh, who said Wade used to tell him, don't tell other people your problems. Half of them don't care. And the other half are glad you have them. <laughs> yes, that's right. So, but they played for presidents. Uh, um, yeah, they were, they were big stars in old time music, which predates bluegrass. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to ask another question here. Um, so I think both of you are kind of fondly recalling um, some memories uh, throughout time. Um, so why do you think some songs and artists have remained relevant and popular over multiple generations? We're talking about musicians from 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, but they're still relevant. I see our uh, chat is populated with a lot of folks and a lot of uh, artists. Uh, they're they're coming up with some names and and things like that. So what what do you think? Why do you think they've remained popular? What's that? What's leading to that staying power? This can't be denied. Charlie Poole's been gone for almost a hundred years, and people still play his songs, um, which is remarkable because. There's no film of him performing. There's no interviews or anything like that he did at the time. Nothing really written about him during his lifetime. All that there is are these records he made from the 20s and early 30s. And they were just such force of nature documents that uh, they've been kept alive for all this time. Um, there's a scene in the book at the very end the first year, the um, Bluegrass Festival, World of Bluegrass by the International Bluegrass Music Association came to Raleigh. I guess that was 10 years ago. Uh, and I came upon this band of kids out on the street playing a Charlie Poole song, Don't Let Your Deal Go Down Blues, which was his big hit from like 1925. And it was just really striking that, um, you know, this guy who was pretty obscure, I, I'm not sure how many people in the general public would recognize his name, but you go to any bluegrass festival parking lot, you're going to hear his songs around the campfire. Yeah. So he's just one of many like that. Yeah. yeah I, I would say a lot of these musicians like the Earl Scruggs and Elizabeth Cotton, um, they developed a style. I mean, it's not like Elizabeth Cotton probably never, uh, you know, before she got, uh, before the folk revival, she maybe never went 50 miles outside of her where she lived. So a lot of these, they developed a style that they owned. Um, and 
you know, with the internet, any kid can kind of get online and, and, and kind of replicate any kind of style. But I mean, Elizabeth Cotton didn't realize that the guitar, she played with the treble string on top and the bass string on bottom. So she just didn't know. And, and, um, and Earl Scruggs, there probably was a three finger style somewhere floating around uh, the area, but he perfected that. Um, and, you know, Earl, when you think of electric guitar, you think of Jimi Hendrix. When you think of the banjo, probably 90% of the people think of Earl Scruggs. Uh, and it's just, they had a style that they developed, uh, you know, it's, it's that old adage of 10,000 hours of doing something. And um, yeah. Um, David, any other thoughts? share um you know i i as as uh Dolph was talking i also thought about the five royales mm -hmm. um you know amazing winston salem r b band in the 50s uh did the original version of dedicated to the one i love um like a lot of north carolina bands they, they it's they they did their innovations and they had success but others had more success than they did with the same thing dedicated to the one i love was a top 10 hit for two other artists but not for them they did well with it on the r&b charts but it didn't really cross over to pop but their guitar player and band leader loman pauling basically invented r&b guitar uh steve cropper from booker t and the mgs um, a generation later was basically just copying from him and it admitted as much. He even did a tribute record to the Five Royals to kind of uh, pay his respects and acknowledge that debt. Um, this time after time, they made music that couldn't be denied, and that's why it's lasted. Yeah, I find that interesting. I think as I was reading through the book, I felt like once I went and looked up a song, and I was like, I don't know if I've heard of that song before, but I listened to it, and I was like, I have, but I know it was sung by someone else. I know a version that was sung by someone else. Um, and I think what also interested me as well or caught my attention was um, the chapter about um, Charlotte kind of almost becoming the next Nashville. Right, yeah. <laughs> that that was mind blowing to me. I was like, I didn't quite realize that, you know, because for me that I was like, oh, Nashville is just Nashville. It's, it's just the heart of it's the home to country music, right? And that was kind of surprising where it seemed like not near misses, but where something was put out into, you know, the, the musical environment by a North Carolina artist or something was started here, but then it, it did catch fire elsewhere. So any yeah. thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it's, it's remarkable how close Charlotte came. And Arthur Smith that was in that chapter was kind of the one who made a lot of that happen. But Charlotte was a huge recording center back in the 20s. Um, Bill and Charlie Monroe made some some of their really key recordings there, uh, Carter Family and various others. Uh, Charlotte just kind of had all the infrastructure in place, but it was the Grand Old Opry starting up at WSM in Nashville that kind of took them over the top. And the Grand Old Opry instantly caught on and just became the radio show to play. And because of that, uh, Music City developed and the rest of the industry kind of coalesced there. But it could have very easily been in Charlotte. And uh, it's it's definitely a big what could have been, no doubt about it. Yeah, WBT radio there, you know, they're, they're what you would classify as a clear channel station. They're the only 11, 10 a.m. in, in America. That's, that's what a, there's just a handful of, of clear, clear channel stations that are, that are, um, that have no, you know, other, um, thing on the band. So, um, that played a key, like the Carter family in the fifties moved to uh, Charlotte to have a show on WBT. interesting to know that that was all kind of in place there and, yeah. and it just didn't, didn't happen for whatever reason one reason or another um okay uh let's maybe uh have maybe one more song or one more um question for you <laughs> if you can uh 
narrow it down. Uh, or if you want to say, <laughs> what is your favorite uh, North Carolina music artist or song? Do you have one that just means more to you? Wow. Um, I would say it's probably the in my mind only super group that uh, exists based in on various Winston-Salem artists, uh, members of DBs and Let's Active, who uh, I think of in my mind as a single unit, even though they were two distinct bands, but they kind of came up around out of the same scene at Reynolds High School. And uh, Mitch Easter and Peter Hulsapple and Chris Stamey, uh, yeah, they're just kind of my Lennon McCartney figures all rolled into one. So some of my favorite all-time records from, uh, from uh, that have come out of North Carolina were from there. And that was some of the first I heard too. I was familiar with uh, both, of the, both of those bands, Let's Active and the DBs before I got here. One of the few. So yeah, that's what I would say. Dolph, how about you? Well, um, I probably would say the song that uh, is the, the fifth most played song in the 20th century on radio. It's been played 8 million times on the radio. And that's Stand By Me by Benny King. Yeah, when you hear the bass line of that song, probably 90% of people in America know that song. It, it's, a, it's a psalm in a lot of ways. Great song. Thank you for sharing. I know some folks are also sharing uh, through the chat. Um, Wendy noted the DBs were so much fun to see in the late 80s. Um, and Elizabeth said Reynolds High School near downtown Winston-Salem. Amazing talent came out of that school. Uh, we have some, some David Wilcox, Black Mountain, yeah. McDibbs fans. <laughs> um, so a lot, of, a lot of appreciation for our music here in the chat. Um, all right, so before we get to our audience uh, Q&A, which we'll do um, shortly, so if you've got a burning music question for our panelists, please put it in the chat or the Q&A. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite uh, David and Dolph to tell us uh, what they're working on currently or what they would like to kind of share with the audience. And um, Dolph, I hope you share a little bit about what you do with the Music Hall of Fame too. Okay. David, you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, I'll lean over here. That is my next book. Uh, oh, Didn't They Ramble, Rounder Records and the Transformation of American Roots Music. And that will be out this fall on University of North Carolina Press. Um, Rounder is best known for their big sellers, Alison Krauss, George Thorogood, uh, Robert Plant with Alison Krauss. But they have an amazing catalog. Um, they started it up in 1970. The three founders who you can see if you're on, on that record cover, here's the close up of the preview. Sure. Uh, they were college kids up in the Boston area. And during the 60s, they were going to protest marches, hopping on freight trains, you know, living this kind of Kerouacian existence. And they started going to folk festivals down south. Union Grove was the first they uh, one they went to. And they just fell in love with roots music. And they started, they, they would see these artists that they felt like should put out records, but nobody was doing it. So they started doing it themselves. And somehow this little label that they started out of their apartment has lasted 50 plus years. Uh, and they have put out between three and 4,000 albums. That is wow. more than one per week at oh. a time when it was remarkable. You were doing well if you're putting out one a month, but they put out one a week for more than 50 years. It's really quite astonishing. And just almost any style of music you can imagine they put out. So uh, their archive after they retired wound up at uh, UNC Southern Folk Life Collection and UNC Press got me to do the book about them. And uh, I thought it turned out well, but we'll see what the rest of the world thinks, October 17th. All right, well, we'll be looking for that from UNC Press uh, and you on October uh, 17th. Um, thank you for sharing that that is coming out. And uh, Dolph, why don't you tell us uh, what you're up to, what you're okay. working on? <laughs> I've got two artists, uh, just to uh, comment on Rounder. I've got two current artists uh, on Rounder Records, one Sierra Farrell and one is Amethyst Kia. So we're uh, 
honored to have two that are uh, continuing the tradition there. Um, so I'm the chairman for the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame, and we have our induction class coming in in October. Uh, Scotty McCreary, uh, Fetch and Bones, rock band out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Betty Davis, uh, Loudon Wainwright, uh, Bill Fatback Curtis, and then um, George Beverly Shea. So we have uh, we have uh, our event in mid October, and I urge everyone to come to it. Uh, we're going to have Scotty and Loudon and Fetch and Bones performing. So uh, it's a um, it's a beautiful night uh, of entertainment. It's um, a lot of love is in the room. Um, so, but uh, on a, another little note that there's some, Our State Magazine has uh, written about a 40 page um, uh, article, nu numerous articles uh, in um, the current edition, you'll see the peaches on the cover and uh, uh, but it's really good. Mark Kemp's got some good stuff about the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame and what we do there. And, and uh, so I would uh, I would strongly suggest people to pick that up. And then the Avett Brothers, they have a musical that will be in the D.C. area at a place called Artist Stage. I mean, Arena Stage um, in uh, late November to December 30th. And we've been working on that project for about eight years now. So I urge everyone to get to DC and watch it. It's it's a very powerful, very moving. Uh, it's not like the story of the band. It's their music put to a story. It's, it's very powerful. That's what I was going to ask. Was it like a story of how they came up or how the band came together? But um, it's a story set to yes. their well, there was an album we put out in 2004 called Mignonette, and, and it was about a, um, it's called The Custom of the Sea, where um, when a boat sinks and, and you get into a dinghy, my favorite nautical word, uh, you get into a dinghy, and uh, for survival, you sort of choose uh, straws on who gets eaten. <laughs> so... There's a maybe there's a lot of meat on the bone, maybe not. So, uh, but yeah, it's it's very powerful and in um, a lot of a lot of big um, a lot of big names, big hitters in in the um, musical world, Broadway world that are involved with it. So we're we're honored. Um, it, to me, the Avit songs there, other than Scott, Seth, and Bob performing the songs on stage, this is where the songs take flight the most in this musical. It's an awesome thing to see. I'm very proud of it. That's Somebody's good. asking in the chat uh, if there's another Avett Brothers record coming anytime soon. Uh, we will have one in 2024. Mm -hmm. We're working on that now. So more to come, more details to come. Right. Cool. Hot off the presses, fresh from the source. You heard it here first, right. 2024. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, well, thanks uh, for sharing all of that. So I think uh, we will open it up to um, questions from the audience. So I'm going to have my colleague Melanie on mute. Uh, Melanie, do we have some audience questions for our panelists this evening? We do. And thanks so much, Melissa. And thanks, everyone, David and Dolphus, for joining us this evening. What a great conversation. I have uh, learned a lot and can't wait to hop off this and turn on my radio, <laughs> put some tunes on. Um, so we have a question um, from David. And if there's anyone else that has a question, please do type those in the chat and we'll have some time to, to discuss those. Uh, David asks, three of the most important figures in North Carolina music history are Peter Holsapple, Mitch Easter and Don Dixon. Do you have any thoughts on these three important North Carolina musical figures? Uh, I love them all. Um, they're responsible for some of my favorite records of all time, um, especially Mitch and Don. They were co-producers of the first two REM full-length albums recorded in Charlotte. And um, the chapter on Mitch Easter opens with a scene of uh, wildly self-indulgent of me describing the first time I ever heard R.E.M. 
on the radio and it put me in something like a trance. And uh, talking to Mitch years later about making that record and then seeing the tape machine he had used to make it while in his studio was just That's one of those full yeah. circle moments, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have to add that uh, meeting Mitch and Don, that's two of the biggest highlights of my musical career because R.E.M. at that time, yeah, they made me so proud to be from the South. Um, and Mitch, such a sweet fella, and um, he was inducted into the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame a few years ago, and I got some guys, some of the REM guys to, to make a video message for him. And I thought that was, yeah, it was, it was really, those records are really special that Mitch made and he's had great. And Don, all, all those guys are super. Yeah. We have a lot of REM fans in the chat. They were with <laughs> REM, so I'm sure much like uh, many of us. So um, we'll leave this open. Uh, Let's see. Don Dixon did a show at Cat's Cradle a year or so ago, a spur of the moment kind of thing. It was very fun. So he plays bass for Mary Chapin Carpenter. So if you see her uh, touring, you'll see Don uh, laying down the low end. He's also one of the all time great raconteurs that you will ever meet. Um, if you ever get a chance to just kind of hang out with him. And he's very friendly and approachable. Yeah. Um, he's one of those guys who's been around the world twice and talked to everybody at least once. And he's got stories about everyone. He'd be a heck of a book subject if I could talk anybody into doing it. Yes. I don't know. Sounds like you have your, an idea for your next next book. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions for our panelists while well, we've got them? Um, if you've got a question, something. Uh, you're thinking about, um, just pop that in the chat there. Uh, otherwise, it looks like a lot of people are just sharing a lot of memories. So there's very clearly uh, a lot of um, nostalgia and, and cultural significance for folks that are remembering things so fondly. Um, just being a gal, uh, Cheryl says, being a gal from South Carolina, North Carolina, growing up in the 60s and 70s, no cable, WBT was king. Um, some great behind the scenes stories. Thanks for sharing. Yes. Um, so we have uh, another question, I think, Melanie. I, I very selfishly have a, a question um, for, for both of you all. Um, you know, maybe for those that didn't read the book or kind of, you know, we're trying to pique some interest. Could you all share maybe a couple of other names of, of maybe some uh, either popular or, you know, maybe kind of folks that you discovered right uh writing this book and kind of being in this industry that maybe we could come away with and you know like I said I'm going to go turn my radio on so maybe some some suggestions of things that we might uh choose to listen to after this right um I, I moved uh here to Charlotte a couple of years ago and one of the first things I learned about was uh George Clinton was from here of P-Funk. I had no idea. So maybe if you could just share a couple of other, uh, you know, kind of fun facts or things like that, that'd be really great. Well, one of P-Funk's key members for many years was Maceo Parker, who also played with Prince and James Brown and pretty much seemingly everyone else of, con of consequence. And he still lives in Kinston and still tours the world and still sounds great. Um, if you ever get a chance to see him, highly recommend it. Um, Tiff Merritt is somebody more recently very good in the Americana field, um, and she's just always got some interesting project going on, some interesting commission that she's working on. I need to check in with her, I'm, I'm realizing, it's been a while, but uh, there's, there's a couple of names. I'm actually just going through the table of contents to jar my memory. Um, John D. Loudermilk is someone people oh, should yeah. look up. Just an astonishing songwriter. Um, everything from Tobacco Road to Cherokee Nation. Um, just songs you've heard forever on AM Oldies Radio. Uh, just look, look up John D. Loudermilk sometime. Um, yeah, he's got a great instrumental called Windy and Warm. 
that huh? Doc would play some, Doc Watson would play some. You know, you mentioned Maceo, you know, and in the book it mentions James Brown recording Papa's Got a Brand New Bag at uh, at Arthur Smith's studio. Uh, James also recorded the James Brown show uh, at Arthur's studio. He would do his show there uh, that was syndicated to to soul stations around America. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many little, little stories with, uh, um, yeah. I'll, I'll tell a quick story. Somebody else mentioned in the chat, Jim Lauderdale, and he's not really in this North Carolina book. However, he is in this one. The first, the book opens with a scene at Union Grove festival where Jim Lauderdale as a teenager attended and he really got into the music and he was wanting to get some records and he came across an old Volkswagen van where some people were selling records out of it and it turned out that was two of the founders of Rounder Records they used to go around to folk festival (laughs) and do this Johnny Appleseed routine sell folk records both the ones they put out and the ones other labels were putting out so uh, as he put it, it was as formative for me as the acid I dropped that weekend for the first time. <laughs> I think we do have um, another question. So Melanie, do you want to read that off for us? Absolutely. Yeah, we have a question um, about Rainbow Kitten Surprise. Oh. <laughs> I had a person <laughs> this person uh says i had a person from australia mention north carolina music and particularly intrigued with rainbow kitten surprise from boone what are your thoughts about how electronic media can share north carolina's great music around the world uh they'd like to add i like rainbow kitten surprises fever pitch and didn't know of them until i was asked about this uh, from my friend to go see them in concert so any thoughts on that Well, I could I could add a quick little thing about them. Uh, I think they, you know, formed in Boone, North Carolina. A couple of the guys are from uh, Robbinsville, North Carolina, which is very west, western North Carolina. And last year, uh, the Abbots, we do three nights at Red Rocks, and they followed up. I mean, the day after us, they did two nights. And I sent them a note, uh, just I, we've never had any contact with them because they're a lot younger. And I sent them a note wishing them the best of luck and have fun. And and uh, their manager wrote me back and and said that a couple of the guys learned how to play guitar listening to Avit songs and that on the uh, bus, they sing Avit songs and they can do a kind of a greatest hits of Avit uh, selections. So, um, I thought that was real, real. So they were real, uh, happy that I'd written in and I was real happy to get that response. I thought that was pretty cool. So they're doing very well. I know they've taken a little break, uh, from the road, but, uh, hopefully they'll be back and, and, uh, continue. Now, someone else on the chat asked if any uh, surprises at the Red Rock shows coming up. (laughs) Well, there's always surprises, you know, um, I will tell you one time the Avits played, uh, 101 songs over three nights <laughs> and they only repeated one song, which was, I think it was I am loving you, I think. Uh, but I thought that was pretty incredible. I think they were on stage for about seven total hours. Wow. Uh, you know, over the three night run. So, uh, kind of Springsteen esque, the hardest uh, working bent, bunch in showbiz, right? Right, but yeah, we'll we always kind of they always kind of do something fun and exciting out there, so it's always a good time. And if if anybody's never been to Red Rocks, it doesn't matter, not just you don't have to go see they go see anybody there, it's just such a beautiful, great place. Can confirm. I was at the Boulder Daily Camera before coming here and reviewed many a concert there. And an amazing place. Yeah. Somebody uh, you know, in the chat referred to it as a bucket list place. And that's right. Yeah. Everybody should go there at least once. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, so uh, Veronica noted North Carolina has a hip hop scene as well. Do we want to <laughs> touch on that a little? Because honestly, and I think it was very recently, I saw a viral video of a wedding couple who is from North Carolina, right? Like they wanted their guests to have the North Carolina experience and they had P.D. Pablo play their wedding. <laughs> he was playing, you know, he, he did the song for them. So um, that's awesome. Yeah, it, and it it was very recently too, and I was like, oh, I, I remember that song from I won't say how many years ago, but I, I remember <laughs> it being a popular song on radio. Um, so can we maybe touch on? We have we have some time. Can we touch on um, North Carolina hip hop? Yes, um, there is, an, and there is a chapter about the, the specifically devoted to hip hop in the book, uh, mostly about Little Brother. And uh, they came out of this very vibrant scene in the 90s, uh, in, uh, mostly in Raleigh, uh, Yag Fu Front and Lords of the Underground, who had some success. And uh, they formed at North Carolina Central in Durham, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and did incredibly well on their own. Um, the Listening, which came out uh, 20 years ago, wow, uh, was kind of a seminal work on the backpack hip hop set. And uh, a couple of years later, after they sort of went their separate ways or Ninth Wonder did anyway, he emerged as uh, one of the top hip hop academics in the country. Um, mm -hmm. He's taught at Harvard. He teaches at Duke as well as Central. Uh, he runs his own production company, record label. He's always producing artists. Uh, he's produ uh, Rhapsody is one of his big acts. He's Grammy nominated multiple times. He's worked with Kendrick Lamar. Uh, just had an incredible run. And uh, far from the only hip hop group out there from, from North Carolina, one of them, Cooley High, the DJ lives right around the corner from me here in Raleigh. Wow. Yeah, Ninth was inducted into the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame the same year as as Mitch. And Ninth is from the Winston-Salem area originally. And I remember when Mitch got uh, awarded to come up on stage to be inducted, I, I saw Ninth stand up and, and like, it was like they were on the same team. They were like, he was so proud that somebody also from Winston-Salem was getting in. That was a cool moment. I was really struck too by those two, how similarly, you know, they, they do completely different things. You know, Mitch does this, this rock, much of it kind of retro uh, sounding, you know, reference points from the sixties and beyond and, and ninth doing hip hop, but they really had kind of a similar outlook in that they both had amassed a vocabulary of sounds that they could reproduce yeah. from decades of obsessive listening and music making. Um, yeah. They both talked about crate digging and hunting for old records and stuff like that. And it was, it was striking. Yeah. They have a lot more in common than differences, even though right. they very different things. Yeah. Well that's said. That's a really good uh, point, especially about um, kind of the full circle nature. You know, you said that uh, he started out, playing at a college campus and then he went to go teach about the history of hip hop on college campuses and that's um, really, really interesting and I, I really appreciate that you all kind of drew that cultural like through line right like we have different musicians but they still, you know, bond over over music in general and I think bond over being North Carolinian as well so. Um, yeah, I've got one, one yep. more quick one to add. I know uh, Robert Moog was uh, put into the Hall of Fame a few years ago as in the same year a, a producer, a hip hop or um, rap producer named Jermaine Dupree. And, mm -hmm. and Robert Moog, like he's just about as far away from hip hop and rap as you could really imagine. I mean, he invented this uh, magical keyboard that's uh, total unique and uh, but it's had such a big impact on hip hop and rap. And during the ceremony, he was inducted first. And then Dupree was maybe the third or fourth act that was inducted. And, and um, Moog passed away years ago. So his daughter, when Moog was in, inducted, his daughter got up and spoke. And so 
uh, when Dupree was inducted, he had Moog's daughter stand up and singled her out and told her how impactful her father was to hip hop and rap. Um, and that he would not have a career without her father inventing that instrument. And I thought that that was a special moment during the ceremony. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's great. And I think we do have uh, one more audience question here from the chat that I noted um, about compilations. Uh, Emil notes that the Tobacco A Go Go series of 60s NC Rock was very influential for me. What other compilations would also be a good showcase of NC music? <laughs> um, I, y'all, if you answer that first, I'm going to go grab something from the other room. Yeah, so there's a uh, uh, Rick Cornell had a. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Rick Cornell that um, uh, was a DJ at WXDU, and he wrote for No Depression Magazine and some other publications. And he would turn me on to these, uh, and it could, I'm, I'm not sure what this collection was, but it was, it was soul and R and B records from the seventies or so that were from North Carolina. And some of those were fantastic. Uh, I, I don't know the names of those, but I remember Rick, Rick being so into it and sharing those with me. <coughs> what you got there? There's also Mondo Montage, but recently this came out. And this is incredible. Psychedelic States, the Carolinas, uh, wow. about two thirds of it. It's a three disc set is acts from North Carolina. And it's like Nuggets, the original Nuggets compilation, um, garage bands that kind of came and went. Uh, it's, it's just on CD. You can't get it digitally or anything like that. Uh, or on vinyl so you got to have a cd player in your life to uh, play this but 100 percent worth it this is just wonderful um, awesome. states. okay well there we go um and david just also threw in the chat for those interested in beach music there is the best of the beach released on arista records yeah. we also have that too um, I, see, I see my cousin uh pointing out my cousin's in this chat and he's pointing out audley freed uh audley played in a band where he started out sidewinder then cry love then then the black crows and mm -hmm. audley and a audley's from uh down east north carolina and then robert kearns uh a bass player uh they both play with cheryl crow um and they're both from North Carolina, but they've played with Cheryl for many, many years now. Super nice guys, too. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I think, let's see, maybe Artemisia, we're going to, I'm going to see if I can squeak this question in. Um, she said, in glancing through the book, uh, she was interested in maybe reading about the impacts of herbal renewal, urban renewal, um, in hampering blues artists in Durham. So... David, um, did you kind of encounter anything around uh, that as you as you researched? Yes, um, Durham had an extremely vibrant community, Haiti, where a lot of this music went on, and it was basically destroyed by the Durham Freeway during urban renewal. They tore down some amazing buildings, businesses, and institutions, uh, and set things back there. A whole lot. Um, so yeah, urban renewal had a definite impact and not a good one on Piedmont Blues in Durham. Now, of course, at that point, there there was a certain amount of decay that had set in. This was the 60s and 70s, whereas the heyday of Piedmont Blues there had been back in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. A lot of the old masters like Blind Boy Fuller and uh, Sonny and Brownie and Gary Davis had either died or moved or moved on. So there were some external forces at work, but uh, here as in other places, uh, urban renewal was a lot harder on African-American communities than it was other parts of town. And uh, yeah. Yeah, the section David speaking of, that's where um, Clyde McFadder uh, lived. He was one of the former singers of um, the Drifters 
and uh, had some had some big big hits, but I think he died before he was forty years old. And um, Deborah McFadder, I took her spot. She was the the former chairperson for the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame. And as a little girl, she told me that when her mother would have get-togethers, they would pull out this life-size radio promotion uh, kind of cardboard cutout of her father that radio stations that I mean that record stores would put in record stores to sell records. And it was like, he was still with them when they would have parties. I always thought that was pretty sweet. Yeah, that is, that is. And she had, I mean, his voice through, you know, the recordings, but also to have that, that's interesting. Yeah, he sings like a lover's question. I think he's maybe the lead singer on White Christmas by by the Drifters. Uh, had a lot of big hits. Thank he was you. also in uh, Billy Ward and the Dominoes before the Yes. It, was that common um, to have a lot of movement of, of individual band members between many different bands? Was there a lot of fluidity there? Or was that not so common? In the, a lot of people coming and going, not so much for somebody to go from one band that prominent to another. That's yeah. somewhat unusual. More going solo, like Benny King was in the Drifters and then he went solo, as did Clyde McFadder. Yeah, and how Benny King got the lead spot with the Drifters is he wrote a song called There Goes My Baby that they had a big hit with. And he was in the band at the time, but he was not the lead singer. And the lead singer could not figure out the how to sing the song properly. And Benny King, who wrote the song, told the producer, it goes like this. This is what you need to do. And the producer is like, you know, they had a burning daylight kind of moment there. Will you sing it? And that how that's how he got the lead spot there. So, and the rest is history. So. They say the rest is history. There you yeah. go. <laughs> all right. Um, Melanie, are we all set with any maybe last minute questions? Do we have any more questions from our audience who has thought up some great ones this evening? <laughs> it's been a great discussion and thank thanks everyone for participating and asking such great questions. I don't see any. So thanks, Melissa. I'll pass it back to you. All right. Thank you. Um, so we're going to get wrapped up for this evening. I want to uh, take the time to thank David and Dolph uh, for their conversation and sharing their wealth of knowledge and all of the kind of behind the scenes tidbits and stories. Um, I found that just fascinating and learned uh, a lot. I want to thank our wonderful audience for attending and for asking such great questions and having such great engagement. Um, we appreciate your time. We can see that uh, this music means uh, so much to everyone here, all of the fond recollection of memories and um, and all of that tied to our North Carolina music. Um, so after the conclusion of this event, those of you who registered with an email address will receive a brief survey to complete. We would greatly appreciate you completing this survey to hear your feedback on this program. Um, you can visit our website at www.nchumanities.org to learn more about other upcoming events and to subscribe to our email newsletter to stay up to date with all NC Humanities news and programs. At the top of our program, I teased a, what I'm hoping is a big announcement, so I'm about to make that. <laughs> uh, so before we officially conclude for this evening, we do have an exciting announcement. North Carolina Humanities will be bringing back North Carolina Reads for 2024. We want to hear your feedback about our potential 2024 North Carolina Reads books. So we've created a public survey to see what books interest you the most. <laughs> uh, this link will be available. Um, it's in the chat. It will be on our website, on social media. We'll be promoting this through July. Um, so that survey will be open through early July. Um, so we hope to hear your feedback <laughs> uh, on our titles. Um, and we're very excited about that. Um, and that really wraps up our evening. So thank you, uh, David and Dolph for being here. And thank you everyone for attending. I hope you all have a great evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everybody. See you, David. See you, Dolph. Good luck. Yeah. Take care. Uh, you too. See you down the road.